Native American Voices with Louis Cook and Ray Fadden is brought to you by the Akwazasne Gahwajile Genealogy and Historical Society with funding provided by Onoe and Plenty International. We invite you to listen to the complete series online at www.gahwajile.org. Nyawa jizawa dahunsade. Greetings, we hope that things are well with you. I'm Louis Cook. Welcome to this program about the native peoples of the Americas. Mohawk elder Dianatono, Ray Fadden, is the founder and director of the Six Nations Museum in Anchayota, New York. He and his wife Christine have operated the museum since Ray retired from a career of teaching in the public schools. At the museum, He lectures on the culture, history, and philosophy of the native peoples. You are invited to stay with us to hear Ray Fadden on Native American Voices. There's 30 or 40 American Indian gifts in the world with European or other foreign names attached to them. Very misleading. Like Egyptian cotton, Irish potato, turkey tobacco, India rubber, Jerusalem market choke, Italian beans, or turkey itself. None of which came from Europe. They came from this land and they were gifts of the American. And they were gifts of the American. Ray Fadden taught Indian students in the public school system for 35 years, emphasizing to his Iroquois students an understanding of their history and pride in their culture. When he retired, Ray and his wife Christine founded the Six Nations Museum next to their home in the Adirondack Mountains. The three-room museum was hand-built by Ray Fadden. He also made many of the charts and displays with the help of his son Cojones, John Fadden, now a prominent Mohawk artist and illustrator. The walls of the museum are lined with handmade beaded record belts, wampum belts, photographs and paintings, animal skins, traditional clothing, and artifacts from various native nations. Ray has collected these materials over the last 50 years. Just outside, museum visitors can see model villages, displays of plains teepees, eastern wigwams, wikiups, and of course, the bark longhouse, homes of the Iroquois. A favorite subject at the museum is the substantial contributions native peoples have made to modern society. Ray Fadden says these have ranged across every area of human activity, including agriculture, philosophy, and science. Such words as primitive, pagan, backward, and uncivilized have little meaning when applied to native peoples in light of their own cultural development. Before the first Europeans landed in the Americas, Native peoples in Mesoamerica had developed their own technologies in science, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, fishing, metalwork, construction, trade, agriculture, and food plants. The most well-known food is corn. But about Indians, this. She said the American Indians gave corn to the world, and that was it. Give corn. kinds of corn they developed all together? Knox or six or seven, like that like school book says. All together, they developed over 300 kinds of corn. Think of it. All the beans in the world came from the American Indian, except for two. Horse and soybean, they came from China. All the rest came from Indians. The Iroquois alone had 12 or 15 different varieties. Even that famous dish you hear so much about, Boston baked beans, was a Wampanoag Indian dish taught to the pilgrims by the Wampanoag Indians. That was the first time that white people enjoyed several other dishes that we enjoy today. Clam chowder, oyster stew, pumpkin pie, believe it or not, cranberry sauce, corn soup, popcorn, all of our corn, our beans, pumpkin, squash, celery, buckwheat, maple sugar, maple syrup, vanilla, chocolate, peppers, tapioca, Irish potato. That's right, it didn't come from Ireland like everyone thinks, including the Irish people. It saved the Irish people, yes, it saved the people of the world, but it was a gift of the American Indian. That nation of Indians that developed the Irish potato and gave it to the world. Do you know how many kinds they had? 
They had over 79 varieties of Irish potatoes. Sweet potatoes, peanuts, popcorn, chewing gum, peppers, pineapples, tomatoes, and many, many more food plants came from the American Indian. According to the Museum of Arts and Science in Rochester, and that's one of the best museums in this country, one nation of Indians, the Inca Indians of Peru, are to the world, developed and gave to the world more agriculture today than all the European people put together. Think of it. French, Scotch, Irish, German, Polish, and all the rest. They didn't give as much as that one Indian nation did. Over 80 food plants are known to have been given to those people. Now, if that isn't a wonderful contribution to today's civilization, I would like to know what is. Not only did the American Indian give many things to eat, they gave other things. You would have had a hard time getting here today if it hadn't been for one gift of the Indian, and that's rubber. First time white men ever saw rubber, they saw Indians playing a game very similar to basketball. And when that ball came bouncing toward them, do you know what they did? They lost the record of what they did. They turned and started to run away from it. They thought it was alive. That's the first time white men ever saw rubber. And those Indians weren't just playing a game. They had practical uses for rubber. They were wearing waterproof clothing. They had rubber boots on. What would we have done without quinine and Indian medicine? We might not have built the Panama Canal or won World War I. Quinine is one of many medicines we use today, gifts of the American Indian. There's quinine, cocaine, curare, save the baby, and according to Ripley, believe it or not, the first iodine and aspirin were American Indians. In the 400 years that white men have dominated these two continents, they haven't discovered one, not even one medicine plant that wasn't known by Indians. Even that shirt you have on is probably made out of cotton. If it is, it's American Indian cotton. No cotton in the entire world had longer or finer fiber than the kind the American Indian developed and gave the world. White men, when they first saw cloth made from it, thought it was silk. Today, it's not only grown here in America, it's grown all over the world, along with the best, the longest stable cotton developed anywhere, called South Sea Island cotton, also a gift to the American Indian. It's true the Egyptians had a cotton, a short, fibered, crude cotton. I doubt very much if it's grown commercially anywhere today. History shows that Marxist theory has been influenced by the great law of the Iroquois. The curious root of that influence lay through two anthropological works of Lewis Henry Morgan, a Rochester, New York lawyer who is called the father of American anthropology. Morgan's association with the Iroquois in general, and with Seneca Ely S. Parker in particular, led to the publication of the League of the Haudenosaunee, or Iroquois, in 1851, and the Ancient Society in 1877. At that time, Karl Marx was completing Das Kapital and taking copious notes on Morgan's studies. Before he could incorporate them into his work, Karl Marx died, but his successor, Friedrich Engels, relied on his notes and the theories of Morgan, which later became the core of ideas for the origin of the family, private property, and the state in 1884. Engels spoke highly about the law of the great peace, saying, and a wonderful constitution it is in all its simplicity. No soldiers, no police, no nobles, kings, governors, judges, no prisons, no lawsuits. Engels found that the Iroquois lived a pure example of the communist idea. There cannot be any poor or needy. The communal household and the families know their responsibility toward the old, the sick, and those disabled in war. All are equal and free, the women included. However, not only those embracing communism looked to the Iroquois as role models. A century earlier, those who drafted the American Constitution saw much in native society to incorporate into their own. When Benjamin Franklin made his proposal for a union of the colonies at Albany in 1754, he pointed to the League of the Iroquois as a successful Confederate League of Nations. In such forms as the methods by which Congressional Senate and House conferees work out bills and compromise sessions, for instance, one may recognize similarities to the ways in which the Iroquois League functions. Even the League symbols, the eagle perched atop a pine tree, clutching in its talons the bound arrows of the nations, were to be borrowed by the new nation. At the Six Nations Museum, Ray Fadden discusses the origin of the Great League of Peace, its practices, and factors which contributed to its political longevity. Yo, honey, 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 yo,
government of the United States of America is patterned not after any government that came from Europe. The white man didn't have a democracy in Europe when he came over here. He believed in the divine right of kings and queens all over Europe. That's not a democracy, that's a dictatorship. The Iroquois had a pure democracy. It wasn't run by corporations, it was run by people. A chief was not like a king and queen, or a duke or a baron, whose oldest son became king, baron, duke, when his father died. A chief represented his clans, in other words, his people. He was put in office by his people. And he stayed there as long as he did what his people wanted. If he didn't, he was warned three times by the women to the war chief. After the third warning, he continued it, he was removed from office and replaced by a chief who would do as his people wish. That's a democracy. That was unknown by white men in Europe. There was only one other people who had a pure democracy. It wasn't a white race in Europe, it was a black race in Africa, called Ashanti, that had a pure democratic system of government. They had separate state governments whereby they control their own internal state affairs, like any state in the United States. They have a central federal government at the capital Onondaga, where they have two houses, a bill in order to become a law has to go through those two houses. What's that sound like? There's where the United States came from. It didn't come from land of kings and queens. They tried so hard in their school books to give the children the impression that everything good and great we have in America today, including democracy, had to come with their ancestors from Europe. And they'll take a magnifying glass and they will desperately, frantically, and vainly look all over the European history to try to find just one democracy to make good that claim. They'll say this. The ancient Greeks had a democracy. In fact, they'll say the ancient Greeks invented democracy. Well, I studied that so-called Greek democracy. If that's a democracy, I live on the moon. In the first place, three-fourths of them were slaves with no voice at all. Any country that has slavery, and that includes the United States when they started, is not a pure democracy. I often wonder why they connect George Washington and Thomas Jefferson with liberty, equality, freedom, democracy. How can they say such a thing? George Washington had over 200 slaves. He didn't see any of them. Thomas Jefferson had over 250 slaves, and neither did he see any of them. Among the Iroquois, slavery was outlawed in all of their territory. And at one time, their territory was as great as the Roman Empire at its greatest height. Furthermore, in ancient Greece, your mother, your wife, your sister, your daughter wouldn't have a voice. Nor would they have a voice anywhere in Europe. Women were considered chattel or property. So how in the world can you call a governor a democracy when one half the people were eliminated because they were women? In my own lifetime, and I'm not a hundred years old yet, I can remember myself when not one white nation in the entire world gave their women a voice. I can remember that. England was the first just before World War I. The United States right after World War I. Spain gave their women a voice 20 or 30 years ago. Switzerland, I heard, gave their women a voice four years ago. But there was a Swiss tourist here, and he said that some of the states still don't give their women a voice. The Iroquois, and not only the Iroquois, but most of these Indian people under them, not only gave their women a voice, they gave them far more rights than white women possess today in this country, America, contrary to that big lie I was taught when I was so high going to school, how Indians treat their women. White women in this country would envy the rights of Iroquois women. Many like to say that so-called great Magna Carta of England has something to do with freedom and democracy. Well, I don't like to hurt anybody's feelings, but truth is truth. The more research I did, the more I began to question anything in their history books. I studied the Magna Carta of England. I had to be a science teacher. I got to see it to believe it. I was surprised that I wasn't surprised. The people I even mentioned gave the nobles, the barons, a little voice, not much of a voice. The great mass of people all over Europe in those days, including England, were serfs, little better than slaves. And those nobles and barons, they were little kings themselves. I have a suspicion, it's my own guess, my own theory, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am, that what political reform England got, he probably was directly influenced by the French Revolution. For good reason. Those nobles in England would have lost their heads as those nobles in France did if they didn't start thinking about their people for a change. They must have realized it. Freedom is very contagious once you get started, especially among an oppressed people, such as Europeans were for centuries under their dictators, their kings their Caesars, their Pope, their Tsars, their Emperors. And where do you suppose the French got their idea of freedom and democracy? From right over here in the American Revolution. From men like General Lafayette and the French soldiers they brought over here during the Revolutionary War to help the Americans. And where do you suppose the Americans got their idea of freedom and democracy? From the American Indians, especially the Iroquois. A very famous lawyer by the name of Felix Cohen has written books on law. 
In fact, he was considered one of the greatest authorities on the subject in the entire world. I always felt very fortunate to have known him. He had a camp right over here in Lake Clear, 10 miles away. He stood right there on the floor, showed me a photostat copy of a report given by three British spies who were sent over here to America just before the Revolutionary War to find out why the colonies were so rebellious against their mother country. And it was their report to their superiors back home, and believe me, it was interesting reading. It was worded something like this. The American Indians are a very peculiar people with strange customs and ways very different from ours in Europe, why the people actually elect their own leaders. And if the leaders do not abide by the will of the people, they remove from office. And this is a serious and a dangerous thing. This is contagious. Our American colonies are now demanding a voice in the government. Something has got to be done about this immediately. I read that report. And why they don't put that in their school books is beyond me. I'll tell you people something. They would find the truth about the old Indians far more interesting, educational, and instructive than the garbage. And I mean dirty garbage with a capital letter and underline. They had been brainwashed in the minds of people, especially children, about Indians for over 200 years. Native peoples had many games and sports to strengthen both body and spirit. Almost all Iroquois sports were organized team games where the emphasis was on team victory rather than individual glory. Victory says the concept of team effort was unknown in Europe before the 16th century, and the idea of team sports was probably carried to Europe along with the idea and material for a rubber ball from Native America. Ray Fadden says that many of these sports are still played today. Give us a lacrosse game. That's a North American Indian game. You ever watch a hockey game? Hockey's a South American Indian game. Comes from the Indians of Argentina. You ever play marbles when you were a kid? You were playing an Indian game, although Europeans also had a type of game called marbles too. You ever go downhill on a toboggan? That's an Indian invention. You ever sit in a hammock? That's an Indian invention. You ever sleep in a sleeping bag? That's an Indian invention. You ever go canoeing, snowshoeing? Both Indian inventions. Northern Indians and Eskimos were the first people to make and use snow goggles. South American Indians were the first people to make and use toothbrushes. Peruvian Indians were the first people to fill cavities with teeth and gold, remove tumors from the brain by successful surgical operations. I've only mentioned a few of the many gifts of the American Indians to the world, but I say here to you people, and I wouldn't hesitate one minute to bet my life on it any day, that white people in this country, whether they realize it or not, are actually living more the way the Indians lived at the time of Columbus thinking and governing themselves the way the Indians did at the time of Columbus, eating food that Indians ate at the time of Columbus, then the Indians living the way the white men did at the time of Columbus. And if Aquia Bezo ever took away the many gifts of the American Indians to the world, believe me, this civilization we live in today would crumble and crumble mighty fast. I'd like to add a little bit more to this message because I feel it's very important. There's a certain missionary priest that was in South Dakota in the Pine Ridge Reservation. His name was Father Edwards. And unlike many missionaries, I personally have seen on reservations, and I know what I'm talking about. I've lived on several reservations in my lifetime, and I've seen what missionaries can do to a people. They're not careful. When you teach people, especially children, to be ashamed of their own grandmothers and grandfathers, to be ashamed of their own history and culture, you are doing them the greatest harm you could do any people, and in the worst way. Because when a child is ashamed of his own people, he has no culture anymore. He is lost forever. And a man, by the way, is a scholar, a student, he's gone back into the records. One out of every ten Europeans in those days, due to insufficient diet, lack of proper nutrients, were deformed in some way. Hunchback, blind, deep, or plain crazy. He said, thanks to what Indian America has given the world in the line of food plants, medicines, ideas of sanitation and health, people today are as healthy and strong as they are. He said, many ideas about health that we take for granted came from Europe, didn't come from Europe at all. They were learned from Indian doctors from this land. Ideas like cleanliness, fresh air, exercise. Confidence you're going to get well. I'm not saying you're going to die tomorrow. We learn from Indian doctors. But get this. He said one of the first laws ever passed against Indians by white people was passed by Queen Isabella, forbidding Indians to bathe so much that bathing was very bad for their health. He said it would be difficult for an eighth grade student in this country today to squeeze into a suit of armor of a man who was considered a big man at the time of King Arthur in Europe. They have never taught real Indian history and culture in either this country or Canada. They have never taught real white man's history and culture in either this country or Canada. There isn't a child that hasn't heard of the famous pyramids of Egypt, one of the seven wonders of the world. There's three large ones and a number of small ones. Our Mexican Indians built literally hundreds of them. How many children know that the biggest pyramid in the whole world is in China, not in Egypt? They brag about the Athenian Way of Rome. Have you ever seen it? It's a few hundred miles long. 
Our Inca Indians have proved the two-lane highway is still in use today after thousands of years. They tunnel through mountains and build suspension bridges over gigantic gorges. One of their roads, if it was stretched out straight, would reach from New York City to Los Angeles. It would make the Appian Way of Rome look like a cow path. You know they have found evidence that the Mayan Indians of Yucatan knew the world was wrong before Christopher Columbus's grandfather was born. They knew that it revolved on its axis, that it was a part of the planetary system with the sun at the center, that the entire thing was a part of the stellar system. They could predict not only solar eclipses, but lunar eclipses. That's a wonderful achievement. They invented zero a thousand years before it was independently invented by the Arabs and the Hindus. They knew every bit of modern mathematics we know today, including calculus. The calendar was more accurate than the Julian calendar, which all of Europe was using at the time of Columbus. There's even evidence that they knew about penicillin. Now, why don't they put those things in their school books? Why was I taught that the only good Indian was a dead Indian? That this civilization is strictly European? I say that white men in this country are more Indian than they are European. And it's about time they realize it. Good soil produces good fruit. All of our ancestors, says Ray Fadden, contributed to global cultures and modern civilizations. That historical record is simply an accumulation of the lives of all humanity. The white man isn't living as his ancestors did 200 years ago any more than the Indians or any other people are. The white man, in a way, has taken an awful lot of credit that doesn't really belong to him. The white man in Europe didn't invent reading, nor did he invent writing, nor did he invent arithmetic. Those three very important and very necessary things, reading and writing and arithmetic, weren't invented by Europeans. They were invented by a dark-skinned people who lived thousands of miles to the south of them on the border of Africa and Asia. Every race in the world has contributed to this civilization. It doesn't belong to one people. It's like a big kettle of stew. It doesn't just have onions in it to make it taste good. There are many, many things in that stew, gifts of every race in the world to make it what it is today, our present-day civilization. The black man has made contributions. He's made wonderful contributions. In spite of the uphill fight that these people had to take because of their dark skin, that coffee we just had over the house was a gift of those people, the black race. I don't know about you, but I don't know how the Indians got along without it. The yellow race has made great contributions to this civilization. Their culture is very ancient. The white men have made wonderful contributions, and so have the red men of America, the Indians. Nobody has a right to say, this is my civilization. Everybody can say, this is our civilization. Mohawk elder and educator, Diana Tolo, Ray Fadden, at the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York, talking about the contributions of Native people to global society. You've been listening to Native American Voices, which is produced in the studios of North Country Public Radio, WSLU-FM, at the St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. Our series of talks and stories from the Six Nations Museum was produced with a grant from the New York Council for the Humanities. Recordings were done at the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York, by WSLU engineer Joshua Sacco. The song, Color Nature Gone, was written and performed by the American Indian rock group Exit and appears on their album Silent Warrior. The associate producer of this series is Peggy Berryhill. I'm Louis Cook, your host and producer, inviting you to join us again next time. Until then, I say, Skano, peace. Let the voice Native American Voices with Louis Cook and Ray Fadden is brought to you by the Akwazasne Gahwajile Genealogy and Historical Society with funding provided by Onoe and Plenty International. We invite you to listen to the complete series online at www.gahwajile.org. Nyawa jizawadahunsadeh.